May I have your attention, please? Hello, may I have your attention? It is time to celebrate the 2010 recipient of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize. Now it is my pleasure to first introduce the President and CEO of the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation, Steve Hilton. After several years in the business world, Steve found his calling to carry on the philanthropic legacy of his grandfather, Conrad, and his father, Baron. He also adheres to their examples on how to apply a business approach to the art of giving. Steve joined the foundation in 1983 and served in numerous positions over the years until in 1998, he was named president and chief executive officer later on in 2005. Steve. Thank you, Judy. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to echo uh, Judy's comments before that uh, this is quite an honor for us at the Hilton Foundation to be a part of the Global Philanthropy Forum. I've been coming here for a number of years, and each time I've always left, as Judy said, inspired and just filled with, with new ideas and uh, new connections. So I, I think it's a, a wonderful combination. And, and Jane is a force of nature, and uh, we're very happy to be a part of this. Now, if I could uh, ask the, for the film to be shown on Aravind. Simplicity of confidence. Doctor, whatever you say, I accept it. Here is an old lady who has got so much faith in me. I must do my best for her. Now, how am I to, going to train myself to do perfection? Over 45 million people around the world are blind. And 124 million are visually impaired. 90% of these people live in the developing world. 12 million of them in India, where, for most, medical treatment is either unavailable or unaffordable. In a way, uh, blindness is, uh, is a fatal disease in India. Uh, the life expectancy after blindness is two and a half or three years. Is a bad expression in India, which is a blind person is someone who is mouth but no hands. More than 80% of the developing world's blindness is preventable or curable. Yet in 1976, blindness was on the rise, but a visionary ophthalmic surgeon named Dr. Govindapa Venkataswamy, known as Dr. V, was at age 58 retiring from the government medical college where he had pioneered mobile eye camps, as well as feeding centers to reduce childhood blindness due to nutritional deficiencies. Despite suffering from a rare form of rheumatoid arthritis, Dr. V set out to fulfill his dream of creating a non-profit eye hospital for the poor. So he founded the Aravind Eye Clinic, 11 beds in a rented house, financed by loans from family members and a mortgage on his home. Dr. V's dream soon evolved to become a worldwide mission for the Aravind Eye Care System to eradicate needless blindness and to make high quality, compassionate and affordable eye care available for all. At first, Dr. V focused on diagnosing and treating cataracts, traveling to remote villages with a team of eye care professionals. 
His eye camps and rural clinics, supported by partnerships with leading international eye organizations, helped Aravind reach India's neediest patients who were never charged. Not for surgeries or other treatment, not even for transportation and food. Out of necessity and a shortage of funds, he began manufacturing his own ophthalmic equipment. At $200 each, imported intraocular lenses were too expensive, so Aravind now produces its own high-quality lenses, which today cost only $2 a piece. These are sold throughout the developing world, and Aravind now has 8% of the global market. Other products also contribute to Aravind's self-sufficiency. But India has the largest number of blind people in the world, and Dr. V was always striving for more efficiency and productivity. Intrigued by how the American corporation McDonald's maintained quality with high volume and low cost, he set out to study its methods, even attending Hamburger University. See, McDonald's concept is simple. They feel they can train people all over the world, irrespective of different religions, different culture, different all those things, to produce a product in the same way and deliver it in the same manner in hundreds of places. Supposing I'm able to produce eye care techniques, methods, all those in the same way and make it available in every corner of the world, the problem of blindness is gone. To begin with, Dr. V had to address the lack of trained clinicians in his country. He persuaded his sister and brother-in-law to leave their lucrative practices in the United States and join him in building his dream. They were the first of three generations of Dr. V's family dedicated to Aravind. The training of eye care professionals soon became an Aravind mandate. Eventually, more and more physicians eager to train in the Aravind system joined the ranks, fueling the expansion of several new hospitals and clinics in the most impoverished areas of India. The team members were guided by the example of Mahatma Gandhi, his simple life, his truthful life, and his spiritual life. From the beginning, Dr. V established that patients would be charged according to their ability to pay, with 30% of its patients subsidizing the remaining 70% who could afford to pay very little or nothing at all. And I don't insist upon that. That man must pay me before I do anything for him. I said, give you the sight man. Let him give whatever he can give. So priority is for human welfare. To staff his growing number of clinics and hospitals, Dr. V recruited hundreds of young women from the local villages and trained them as operating room technicians, nurses, and counselors. Their skills increased efficiency in Aravind's assembly line approach, enabling the doctors to make surgery their primary focus. Today, Aravind's postgraduate courses in all ophthalmic subspecialties attract top medical professionals who wish to learn the latest techniques, to conduct research, and to gain experience by working in the largest eye care system in the world. Aravind's research laboratories cover the entire range of eye diseases, including genetics, immunology, microbiology, cellular biology, and biochemistry. As countries throughout the world seek to learn from Aravind's model, it has become a partner beyond India's borders, consulting with and training hundreds of hospital personnel throughout the developing world. In addition to India, Aravind has created national eye care plans for Rwanda and Eritrea. Its business model has become a case study for universities, and leading medical institutions in the United States and Europe send students to Aravind for training. So we've just arrived, we've only been here for two days and already being in the clinic um, for just a few hours have seen um, all kinds of pathology that I certainly have not seen in the United States and wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to see. More than 30 years after its humble beginnings in a remote corner of India, the Aravind eye care system has handled over 29 million outpatient visits and performed over 3.6 million surgeries. It is the world's largest eye care provider and trainer of eye care professionals, a leading research institute and a manufacturer of affordable eye care products. All of this has been accomplished under the guiding principles of teamwork, respect for all, and compassionate care. When we grow in spiritual consciousness, 
We are into ourselves with all that is in the world. So there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping. It is ourselves we are getting. Well, I think you can see why the jury selected Aravind. And I think what's interesting, there might be some lessons here for us in America as, as we deal with our own health issues. Now, I'd like to um, shift gears a little bit here because I, I was very fortunate to um, oh, be exposed to Aravind uh, while at the Harvard Business School. They had a one of the case studies that we uh, looked at was Aravan. And then shortly after, we got a, um, a nomination to look at Aravan for the Hilton Prize. And I was extremely lucky to be uh, the one who went over to India and spend a few days um, talking, observing, and learning all I could about this very special uh, operation. And in addition, I was fortunate to meet um, Dr. Vin Kataswamy, Dr. V, who was still alive at the time. And spending some time immersed in this organization, one of the things that really struck me was the, the strong kind of spiritual dimension. And I, I would like to quote some words from Dr. V that I think um, you know, captures his, his spirit. If work is approached from a spiritual perspective, then it becomes divine work, and you will accomplish things far greater than you might have imagined. Intelligence and capability are not enough. There must also be the joy of doing something beautiful, the humble demonstration of courtesy and compassion to each patient. Excellence comes from teamwork among those who are caring and committed, end of quote. And I really, again, I believe that this is a central strength of Aravind, and I think that this attitude pervades a lot of the thinking of many of, I'd say all of us, donors and nonprofits in this room. And while former religion is not always directly involved in charitable works, it's interesting when you see how all of the major world religions share a belief in service to those in need. For example, in Christianity, there's a, a, a story in the Bible where God is welcoming some souls into heaven, and he says to these uh, recent arrivals, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was sick, and you looked after me. And the souls responded back to God and said, when did I see you hungry? When did I see you without a home or sick? And God's reply is, in truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And the message, you expressed love for God by expressing love for the poor and disadvantaged. In Islam, the Quran says that all people have been created by the same God, and therefore, we all belong to one great brotherhood. Giving alms to care for the destitute and disabled is one of the five pillars or essential practices of Islam. In Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita says that charity is one among the most sublime virtues 
a human being can be blessed with. And in Judaism, the word for charity, tzedakah, giving to the poor is an obligation, and traditional Jews give at least 10% of their income to charity. I really believe that this, this river of compassion uh, flows through all of us, and again, I think I see it embodied in Aravind. And I, I really believe that this is something that is an obligation that, that we all share, and also a privilege and a joy. And when that spirit of compassion is focused in a disciplined way with clear goals, thoughtful strategies, and sound management practices, the results are incredible as evidenced by the 3.6 million eye surgeries performed by Aravind since 1976. Now I'd like to introduce the man who was at Dr. V's side from the beginning, along with his wife, uh, Dr. V's sister. And, uh, and since Dr. V's death in 2006, he has been the chairman of Aravind Eye Care System, uh, Dr. Nam Puram Salmi, uh, Dr. Nam, and his wife, uh, Dr. Nachier, please come up. Dr. Nam is a distinguished ophthalmic surgeon and a world-renowned specialist in diabetic retinopathy. He and his wife, Dr. Nachier, also an ophthalmic surgeon and vice chairman of Audubon's board, left lucrative practices to help start Audubon back in 1976. So Dr. Nam not only shared Dr. V's vision from the beginning, he is now with his wife in charge of taking that vision with the goal to eradicate needless blindness globally. So with that, I have the very special honor and privilege to present to you the 2010 Conrad N. Hilton Humanitarian Prize. Congratulations. And here is a, a check, symbolically, for $1.5 million. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this sculpture is also a gift. So again, namaste. Good evening to everyone. Indeed, I am very much delighted, honored, and privileged to receive this prestigious Conrad N. Hilton Humanitarian Prize on behalf of our institution and on my own behalf. I take this opportunity to thank all of you, the board of directors and members of Conrad N. Hilton Foundation and family members of Hilton and everyone for having selected us for this award. And we are privileged to join the former Hilton Prize winners and 
We are honored to join them and work with them in the common goal which we will be sharing in future. As has been said, Conrad Young Human Humanitarian Award is given annually, but it is special this year. It is only very fitting that Hilton Foundation has formed a strategic alliance with Global Philanthropic Forum. The worldwide visibility and the recognition that comes with the Hilton Humanitarian Prize to Aravind Care System, in the presence of so many of you, the philanthropists and invited guests, the very important people, and all those who are here, and will allow us to bring our eye care model to alleviate the suffering in many parts of the world, not just in India. And we are also aware that they are concentrating on the blindness prevention, trachoma, or the, the taking care of blind rehabilitation in Boston. The foundation was started with Conrad and Hilton. Though he had ups and downs in his life, he mastered and he became successful in his profession. I heard that only with the advice, constant reminders from his mother to have spiritual investment in whatever ways he is going to do. And that is what made him to work against all the evils which came into life. This story of Aravind Aikar system also is almost similar. The Aravind Aikar system is based on the spiritual movement and spiritual investment with Dr. V. Had and spiritual investment on Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And all has been said, he had intense faith in them, faith and more faith, faith in his own capabilities, faith in the power that is at work behind the wheel, faith in the work to be done, and the offered guidance, that is Sri Aurobindo and mother. So it was started as a 11-bedded eye hospital in 76, grew up to 4,000 beds now in five locations, 35 village centers, and five managed care hospitals. And as has been said, we have done almost 3.6 million surgeries from the inception, that is in 1976. Last year, we have done about 300,000 surgeries per year, last year alone. And that is about 45% of the, our state thing. And this is what, what made him to take up this one. Because of the 45 million blind in the world, 12 million in India, the government alone cannot take it because most of them are poor. So we have to find an alternate way of approaching. And that is how it made him to start this institution. But it was started as a 11-bedded institute. But having had this major mission of attacking 12 million blind in India, he had only very meager the resources. And so he had to pledge the jewels of the family, mortgage the houses, and because the banks couldn't give him money because he is a retired person. This is a retirement project after the age of 58 years. And so the banks thought that it is, that he is not credit worthy. And that is how he had to do that. But anyhow, he was firm. The challenge was how to take care of this massive blindness with the limited resources. And that made him to innovate things which will come in the way gradually, step by step. If the patients are not coming to you, you go to the patients. That is the outreach you saw in the video film, eye camps. And every day in, day out, at least 2,000 eye camps are being held per year. And we do at least 100,000 surgeries through the camps, totally free of cost. And that is one. And also we take care of 
work with the community, for the community, and paying patients only, 30% of them pay, 70% do not pay. And even if they pay, they pay according to the, their ability to pay. It is not the fixed market price they have to pay. And all these things are being done with the standardization of the techniques, standardization of all the, the modern management part of it, and the outreach program, which has, and this led on to the business part of it. Though it is a service project, but also we have to run this project for the sustainability, financial viability, the high turnover, the reputation of the doctors who are working in the eye hospital and produced more patients in the middle child, people who come in large numbers to pay for it. So large turnover of these patients who pay, we were able to generate money so that we could take care of the people at the bottom of the pyramid. That is the 20% of the entire globe, people who cannot afford to pay. And this was essential. This was enough to take care of the people who cannot afford to pay. And that is the, the financial result. Last year alone, we were able to do a $22 million income, of which only $13 million as expenses. We have the surplus. And in spite of doing 60 to 70 percent pay, I mean, free patients, we were able to, and this money is plowed back for expansion. And of all these things, the quality is, was not compromised. The quality was maintained. State-of-the-art technology was maintained. And the patients did not lack anything, whatever they get in the paying hospitals and in private institutions. And all these things are taken care by the and this was the concept of McDonald's concept, which was franchised by uh, Dr. V and which has been explained already. It should be available everywhere, affordable to most of the patients, clean atmosphere by trained people, and all over the world in nook and corner. Why don't we give this vision all over? The main success of our thing is training of our people training of paramedical people. Instead of recruiting doctors with a high cost, you train the school final girls for our need. Every year we do about 300 to 400 paramedical people, train them on the job and the skills, which, and then we can make use of them. With the use of them, for one doctor, four paramedical people, we can increase the productivity. The national average of doctors doing surgery, about 200 to 300 surgeries per year, or even the doctors will be doing 2,000 surgeries per year, per doctor. And that is the advantage of employing, training people at an affordable cost in the school final. That is the, another innovation what we have been uh, doing. And the training part of it, in order to maintain the quality, we have 15% of all the ophthalmologists in India have gone through the training at Aravind Eye Hospital. Not only in India, but also in the developed countries. We have people coming from renowned institutions from the developed countries, even from United States. They rotate through Aravind Eye Care system. So it is a very competitive training program so that we can maintain the quality, we can maintain the the numbers and uh, the standard of surgery. But quality of eye care depends upon, for cataract, not just removing the lens, but you have to put the lens. But in 1990s, we didn't have resources. Each lens was costing about 150 to $200 per lens. And we cannot, we are, we are doing 300,000 surgeries per year. How can you afford to have $150 per so we thought that we will manufacture the lenses with the help of this 300, 400 nurses which recruit every year. We train them and in that we have brought down the price to $3 a piece. And in addition to that, <laughs> even with that $3 a piece, we make money, I think. <laughs> and in, we, 
By that money, we plow back, we support the patient to stop, I mean, start more hospitals and more. Having developed this financially viable, self-sustaining, affordable care, and available to all, and this is mentioned as the Arvind model, it should be available not only in the regional area, but also in all over the country, but also the other parts of the world. So we started what we call Lions Aravind Institute of Community Ophthalmology, where we improve the capacity of the hospital, existing hospital, to improve their productivity. And thereby we are working with 270 hospitals in, the, uh, in India, in Tanzania, or in Sri Lanka, Nepal, China, in various places uh, we are working with them. And the, we have increased the productivity. So it is a global organization. It's not just an, a local organization part of it. We also serve in the policy making for the government, WHO, all places where how we can take this model to other parts of the world to improve the productivity of their ones. So we are finding new ways of working in the community, not only for the outreach activity, we are state the, the, the inf innovations, introducing information technology part of it, in the sense every 50,000 population, we start village clinics and have the trained ophthalmic technician there, have the, the wireless technology, telemedicine facility, connect to the center hospital at Aravind. In that, we have got a good penetration now. That is the state of the art technology. The quality of service also has increased. Penetration into the rural areas has been very successful with this vision, what we call vision centers. Not only that, we also have the mobile uh, eye hospitals connected with the satellite connectivity so that we send it to the very remote places and demand by the ophthalmic technicians. They take pictures, images, sent by internet or by satellite. They are read by the ophthalmologists at the central and the report goes back within 11 minutes so that they will be referred to the concern center. They need not come to Aravind, but they are referred to the uh, concerned places for the pod quality. So this is what we have been doing. And we have, as has been told, we have also gone into the research to prevent blindness. So we cannot depend upon the research findings always coming from other areas, other side of the, because the diseases are different, the, uh, the, uh, the environment is different. So we have to do research for our diseases, for our people, for our kind of. So now we are positioned to do uh, good research, and we have set up a research institute named after Sri, I mean, our founder, Dr. G. Venkata Swami, Dr. G. Venkata Swami Eye Research Center, which was inaugurated just last year. The one example also I have to mention that we are also working with partner as a Clinton Global Initiative for the Diabetic Retinopathy, because that is the next which is coming up. We have signed a memorandum of understanding to take this diabetic retinopathy problem for the entire world by working with a diabetologist and internists and create awareness among them. So we will take it up with the other people, like-minded people working with that Clinton Global the initiative for them. So with Aravind has developed a spectacularly efficient, scalable, sustainable model driven by strong principles of compassion. But it knows, we know beyond doubt that we alone cannot do it. We have to do this magnificent work, the big challenge with the help of the other people, the, with the support from other areas. And we know awards like this, the prices, Hilton Prize, definitely will help us to take the services to not only to Arvind, but also in other areas. Also, not only in one disease, but in all other diseases. 
just like the diabetic retinopathy and other, but with the added partnerships with other philanthropy groups, together we can definitely make a difference. It's not we alone can do it, we have a successful model, but this model should be, can be taken up in a very rapid way. Our growth has been very slow from 1976 till now. We have been very slow because we have been expanding. We earn money, one floor. We earn money, the second floor. That is what we have been going for years together. But now with the support of this kind of prices, definitely we can serve more people at a rapid succession. And so that is what we'll, instead of doing quarter million surgeries per year, we can go ahead with half a million surgeries per year in another five years, or even one million surgeries per year for another five years. And so that, that is what our aim is. That is what we are, our, the goal is. And as has been quoted the, in our video film, as Dr. V's quotings, we call it as a very powerful quoting. When you identify yourself with all that is in the world, with all that is in our world, there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping and it is ourselves we are healing. We are not healing anybody else. It's ourselves we are healing and we are. So with this, I thank once again for all the support you have given for having selected us for this prestigious award. May we all join hands together in an effort to heal ourselves and the entire world. Thank you very much. Dr. Nam, thank you for sharing uh, a lot of the history and insights. You know, two words you often hear at these conferences are scale and sustainability. And uh, I would say um, Aravind is one of the most incredible examples of both. So um, as he searches for his glasses, <laughs> well, it's uh, with great pleasure I introduce to you uh, this evening's keynote address, uh, Dr. Bill Fage. Um A major focal point of Bill's medical work, particularly in the developing world, has been disease eradication and control, and he has played an active role in the eradication efforts of guinea worm, polio, and measles, and the elimination of river blindness. Bill has received more awards than can be listed tonight, but in 2006, the University of Washington dedicated the William Fagey Building, honoring his numerous accomplishments in the field of global health. Of Bill's many accomplishments, the most notable is perhaps his role in creating the strategy that led to the successful eradication of smallpox in the 1970s when he was chief of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and then became director of the CDC. In the 1980s, he helped form and directed the Task Force for Child Survival that accelerated worldwide immunization rates for children from 20% to 80% within six years. He joined the Carter Center in 1986 as executive director and fellow for health policy. He left in 1992, but continued in his role as a fellow. He later joined the faculty of Emory University, 
uh, and is currently Presidential Professor Emeritus of International Health. In 1999, he became Senior Medical Advisor for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and today continues there as Senior Fellow in the Global Health Program. And I have to take personal pride in saying that uh, Bill Fagey is on the board of the Conrad Hilton Foundation, and we're very, very honored uh, for that. If you can measure a man by the number of people he has influenced, Bill would stand taller than he actually is. And at six foot seven, that's saying a lot. <laughs> I've been fortunate to know Bill for quite a few years, and I've always been impressed by a number of qualities in him, one of which is his incredible knowledge of, of global health and uh, his wisdom, his compassion, his wit, um, and his sincere humility. So, Bill Fagey. Thank you, Steve. First, a note of history. The check became a symbolic check <laughs> the year after an award he left it behind on the lectern. <laughs> Three thoughts to start with as we honor our event. The first is from Norman Cousins in 1977 when he said, the real gift the United States has given the world in 200 years is the idea that it's possible to plan a rational future. Arvin does that. The second from William Penn, who said, helping to heal the world is true religion. And the third from a man who went to a fortune teller and was told you will be very, very poor and very unhappy until you're 45. And the man grasped that straw and he asked, what will happen when I'm 45? And the fortune teller said, you're gonna get used to it. <laughs> what Aravin tells us is we can't allow the world to get used to it illness and starvation and thirst and poverty. I don't know for sure why you're here tonight, but I can make some assumptions. The first is that you're not a cross section of the United States. Your goodwill, your optimism, your empowerment, your vision are above average. Number two, you've prospered beyond what most people can expect, and therefore you control more resources than the average person. Number three, you've learned from Mark Twain that the person who does not read good books has no advantage over the person who can't read at all. And so you've learned that the person that does not use resources well has no advantage over the person who lacks resources. And you've already faced up to the fact that you're going to control these resources for only a short time. Life is short. Five, you're not fatalists or you wouldn't be here tonight. You actually think you can change your future and the future of other people, and you think that because you've experienced it. And number six, like many of us, you're probably a control freak. <laughs> And you're wanting to control those resources even after you're gone. <laughs> but let me go even further. Those are pretty certain. But let me add three more things that will apply to many people here, maybe most people here. Some of you are already convinced that the measure of civilization is not found in the GNP or in knowledge or in technology or even in happiness. The metric for civilization is as simple as how people treat each other. And number two, many of you have gone beyond the obvious geographic implications on how you treat people across the city, across the state, across the nation, across the world, 
to time, how you treat people who have not yet been born, who you will never see. And third, therefore, some of you see that your real bosses include everyone who will be born in the future because you're involved in preparing the world they're gonna live in. And for those of you in that category, you came to the right place this week. Because we have heard from this awardee and from others what can actually be done. And so we thank Arvin for the fact that they are leading us in this conversation we have with the future generations. You've heard everything now about how this started. I like the idea that Dr. Govindapa Venkata Swami was then Dr. V. It's part of their efficiency drive. <laughs> But then when you see how this entire family became involved and how their vision was to provide vision, first to individuals, then to an entire country. Gandhi said people often become what they believe themselves to be, and Arvind believed itself to be the vision for India. The ripples of benefit continue to go out uncounted now and they will because they know how to treat each other. And when you see what Dr. Nam has done to continue the growth of this organization, I mean, it's unbelievable that they see millions of people a year do hundreds of thousands of surgeries and 70% of them at no or low cost. So they teach us about how to treat others, but they also teach us something about globalization. I'm reminded of when Martin Luther King talked about the debt he owed to Gandhi, and how Gandhi, in turn, talked about the debt that he owed to Thoreau. This idea of philosophies and beliefs ping-ponging back and forth between cultures. And in a similar way, eye surgeons in the United States now thank Arvind for the fact that they get lenses much cheaper while Arvind, in turn, thanks McDonald's. I mean, think of this. <laughs> and there's something very inspiring about Dr. Nam having been a professor at the Abraham Lincoln Medical School. It reminds me of Democritus, who 2,400 years ago said, the home of a great soul is the whole world. Einstein put it in a different way when he said nationalism is an infantile disease. He said it's the measles of mankind. <laughs> and one lesson from us to take from all of this is we are preparing the world that people will live in. The opportunities are legion and we have learned this week that compassion and caring is not outdated. Some other lessons. Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian and philosopher, once told a story about a man who broke into a jewelry store and stole nothing. All he did was rearrange all the price tags. <laughs> we live in a world where the price tags have been rearranged. And so we put the highest value on athletes and financial advisors, but not on nurses, not on teachers, not on mental health workers. And we put a low price tag on equity. Arvind has put a high price tag on equity and on vision. Schweitzer, in talking to students, once said, I don't know what you're going to do in the future, but what I do know, those of you who are happy will be the ones who have learned how to serve. Third, creativity requires pulling ideas from every place. And then you end up with this unexpected thing that we've talked about, this vision of India experiencing improvement in sight because of McDonald's. And I'm starting to sound like a Big Mac commercial, but <laughs> 
there's something surreal about this, and you wonder, did I hear correctly? <laughs> and it reminds me of a public health colleague who told me years ago about his roommate in college who was from Australia and was often asked to talk about Australia, which he did to Kiwanis clubs and so forth. And one day he was talking to a Baptist church group. And at the end of his talk, a man stood up and asked, are there many Baptists in Australia? The speaker had heard this question so often that in his mind what he heard are there many rabbits in Australia? <laughs> and he said, good Lord, they're the national nuisance. <laughs> he said, we hunt them and shoot them and poison them. <laughs> but they just keep reproducing. <laughs> A fourth lesson that we've learned. <laughs> Coalitions. Some of you will remember, you saw Dr. Ejeta today. He was once on the national basketball team for Ethiopia. So I told him tonight, I'm going to tell a basketball story. Some of you remember when Stacy King was a rookie for the Chicago Bulls and one night, he had a disastrous night, he made one point. It was the same night that Michael Jordan made 69 points. And as Stacy King was trying to get to the dressing room without being caught, a reporter grabs him and asks him, how did you feel about the game tonight? And Stacy King said, I'll always remember this as the night that I teamed up with Michael Jordan for, 20, for 70 points. <laughs> So that's what coalitions are about, and Gandhi said we should spend as much time learning about interdependence as we do on self-reliance, because he said there is no other way. Our accomplishments are because of coalitions, and we heard today about leadership at the luncheon uh, session, and how leadership today is not found in a title, it's found in the person that successfully makes a coalition work. Arvind is a, an example of a coalition that keeps enlarging and now includes the Hilton Foundation and now includes everyone in this room that figures they want to somehow participate. Coalitions are getting more complicated, but it's a coalition of Harvard University, the Merck Drug Company, the Gates Foundation, the government of Botswana, and dozens of small NGOs and church groups in Botswana that has brought the HIV positivity rate of newborns in Botswana from 40% to 4% in less than a decade. I mean, it's incredible. It is living proof. Standing together brings strength and hope and change. I visited a hospital in Botswana 10 years ago before people were talking openly about AIDS. They called AIDS a radio disease that they heard about on the radio, but no one used the word in talking. I made rounds at a hospital where perhaps 90% of the patients we saw had AIDS. The word was never used. They talked about tuberculosis and cancer and other things that were causing these people to die. We went to a room afterwards and I asked the medical officer in charge, how do you maintain your mental health? How do you get up and come in every day? He sat and stared at me until I regretted having asked the question. And then suddenly tears came down his face. And he said, surrounded by his staff and visitors, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone before. He said, I was born one of four sons. My three brothers have died of AIDS and I have no choice. We have choices and the opportunity to exercise them wisely. The final example I'm going to use, we heard at noon today about education in Ghana, and the importance of looking forward 
rather than memorizing which is looking backwards. This year, there was a contest for student entrepreneurs, and there was a dinner in Seattle as people from around the world came in that had won regional uh, contests. The winners turned out to be two Ghanaian students. They took the problem of adulterated drugs. Some people think a third of all the drugs in Africa are probably adulterated. And they asked, how do you use cell phones to change that? And they suggested, just as with Lotto, you scratch off something that gives you a number, put that on every vial of medication, you scratch it off, you dial a number on your cell phone, enter those numbers, and you immediately find out whether this is adulterated or whether it's good. It's such a simple solution. Students from Ghana. A tsunami killed 200,000 people, and it got our attention. An earthquake killed 200,000 people, and it got our attention. But what's the rest of the story? We heard from Jeff at the first session this morning that we lose 200,000 children under the age of five from preventable causes every eight days, and it doesn't get our attention. My point, you don't have to look far to find worthy projects, things that need doing, choices to be made, places where we can become the voice for the poor and the disadvantaged. My last point. The book, The Lucifer Effect, talks about this experiment at Stanford that we've all heard about, where students became guards or prisoners, and both groups were corrupted within days. The teacher was the warden, and the teacher became corrupted. And now he wrote this book, finally, What Are the Lessons We've Learned? And he goes to the positions of power, whether it be between Catholic priests and children, whether it be guards in a prison in Iraq, whether it be American soldiers in Vietnam, whether it be our elected officials who do not want to lose power at the next election. And he said, we're always looking for the bad apples without acknowledging that the real problem is a bad barrel. And when 200,000 children die every eight days from preventable causes, this is a bad barrel. But then we learn at the end of the book that it is possible, because there are plenty of examples, of leaders to provide good barrels where average people perform better than average consistently. The Hilton Foundation seeks out such examples for their humanitarian prize of good barrels where average people perform better than average consistently. And our event is an example of a good barrel. It's a, an example for us not to just em, to honor, but to emulate. This room is full of people who have demonstrated their ability to lead and create all kinds of companies and products. So we do honor to Arvin if we don't simply honor them, but emulate them and go out and make more good barrels. AIDS in Botswana, smallpox eradication, Arvin all remind us that coordinated action by people can, up, can provide for a rational future. This does not have to be a world of blindness and plagues and disastrous governments and conflict and uncontrolled health risks. And we should settle for nothing less. We should settle for nothing less. Thank you. Today, one of the speakers said, we must tell stories. We must tell stories that are uplifting, and that's going to change things. 
I hope tonight we have left you with an uplifting story because of Aravind and what it is doing to change the world for blindness and to inspire all of us to emulate what they have accomplished. And I would be surprised if we're not all leaving this room with Bill Faggy's challenge to do more, the joy of everything that Bill ever shares with us, and the inspiration to go out and just do it. Thank you for this evening. <laughs>